Hello and welcome to First Look ETF. I'm Stephanie Stanton. It is great to have you with us for our August edition. Coming up on today's show, the rapidly growing blockchain market and a new ETF that aims to capitalize on it. Plus, beyond just Amazon, an actively managed ETF that's putting its dollars into companies that deliver products that we use each and every day. And finally, fighting inflation. We'll tell you about a recently launched ETF built to hedge against runaway inflation. But first, let's get a quick recap of the newest ETF launches making their debut on the New York Stock Exchange. Joining us now live from the NYSE is Douglas Jonas. Hi, Douglas. It's great to have you with us. Oh, it's great to be back, Stephanie. It's uh, dog days of summer here, but, but still really busy. Yeah. Give us the latest numbers. What are we looking like? Yeah, even though it's the summer, Stephanie, July has been incredibly busy. 22 new ETFs launched, raising over $200 million in new assets for the industry. Who's counting? We are. That's 224 new ETFs year to date, bringing in over $26 billion in new net assets. So again, the ETF industry continuing to do really well in the face of probably really tough capital markets. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, With that being said, what are some of the other notable trends that you guys are seeing right now? Yeah, of course, you know, the active conversation, we've had that, I think, every single month, still trending in a a good direction uh, year to date. 57% of all launches this year have been active, but that's lower than last year. Passive is certainly making its way back. You know, if we look at last year, 65% of all launches were active. Uh, In the world of active, right, two new New York Stock Exchange proxy ETFs launched last month, uh, all using the proxy methodology. That's active managers who don't want to show their holdings every day. Those that are looking to to list ETFs, launch ETFs, but don't want to show them, they can come here to the New York Stock Exchange and we'll help them. But as you know, ETFs continue to drive innovation. I think that's what today's show is going to be all about. ETFs opening up the doors for investors. They can invest in the data revolution. They can invest in, invest in the evolution around digital and physical infrastructure. And of course, using ETF as an investment tool for portfolios during high inflationary environments like we're seeing today. Uh, and I think you're going to tackle a lot of those themes in today's episode. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit more about inflation a little bit later on in the show. But yeah, thank you so much, Douglas. Investors always looking for places to put their money, especially nowadays. Just a quick reminder that First Look ETF is simulcast on all the major podcasting platforms, including iTunes and Spotify, Amazon Music. So be sure to check us out there. Secure data storage and transmission is more important than ever these days. The supply chain crisis continues to be a thorn in the side of investors and the economy overall. Well, analysts say logistic solutions must be expanded across the transportation ecosystem in order to correct global distribution problems. Well, joining us now is Sean O'Hara, president of Pacer Financial. Sean, it is great to have you with us. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, so your firm recently introduced two ETFs targeting different stock market categories, data storage and transmission and the supply chain. Let's start with the Pacer Industrials and Logistics ETF. That ticker symbol is SHIP, S-H-P-P, which deals specifically with the supply chain crisis. What is the strategy of this fund and why do you guys see this as a timely opportunity? Yeah, that's a great question. We launched uh, a, a real estate-based ETF, INDS, which essentially owns the buildings that sort of connect the supply chain. And so we thought this was just a natural progression. Inside of these buildings is a, in, in, in really a, a complicated web, if you will, of technology and software and robotics that, that moves the packages and the supplies around those buildings and then gets them from one place to the other. So we just thought it was a natural progression. You know, the supply chain's been a big problem uh, for the last several years since COVID, uh, one of the major drivers perhaps of some of the inflation that we're seeing. And so uh, we thought this would be a great sister product if you if you were interested in owning the distribution network on the building side, you could own the technology and the logistics and the software and the actual uh, transportation names that move all these products and goods and services around. And much like what we said with our initial premise on on INDS, we don't think this business is getting smaller. We actually think it's going to get a lot bigger. Quickly, give us a few names we might recognize inside SHIP. 
Well, uh, you know, the most important name would perhaps be something like a Burlington Northern, which is a you know a name that uh, Warren Buffett's a pretty big investor in. Um, so just you know, as a as a transportation name, Atlas Worldwide, which is a name not many people know about, but you know, when um, when COVID hit, then the airlines shut down commercial flights. Um, you know, m most commercial flights have sort of a, a package delivery service embedded in the belly of the beast, if you will, with all those planes not actually flying passengers around. Atlas Worldwide became one of the big suppliers of those plane routes. Okay, so you were, you guys have the hard goods side covered. Now we're going to shift over to the tech side of it. Secure data storage and transmission, of course, is more important than ever these days. Your other fund is the Pacer Data and Digital Revolution ETF, which the ticker there is TRFK. Tell us more about the fast evolving digital landscape and how TRFK works. Well, this is a story that, that, you know, a 10 year old can understand, you know, because they're sort of wedded to their cell phone every day looking at videos on TikTok or maybe a, uh, a Gen Z or, um, you know, video game fanatic or maybe just somebody who owns a business like we do, who is relying upon the transmission of data. So this sort of came out of another real estate play. We have a real estate ETF SRVR that owns the the data centers, which are the actual buildings, and then the cell phone towers, which are actually how this sort of cellular data moves around. And as we go from 4G to 5G, those packets become denser and we need more actual physical buildings and more cell phone towers. But what we don't own in server, uh, just like we don't own this in INDS, is we don't actually own the technology. So all of the bits and the bytes actually get moved around by computers and chips and software. And so what we're trying to do is sort of take everything out in from that's inside the building and say, well, let's break it apart and lay it on the ground and let's see what we want to own. So you're going to own names like Snowflake or NVIDIA or the big chip makers um, as a sort of a pure play technology approach to or a thematic approach to, to capitalizing on the digital re revolution. Uh, it's a pretty simple thing to understand. We're going to use more data, not less, and more computing is going to take place in the cloud, not less. And so those folks that provide the software, hard, hardware, uh, the connectors, uh, the circuitry, uh, the cooling fans, as an example, for all of that to take place are the kinds of names we're going to own in, inside of TRFK. Yeah, it sounds like definitely have a broad range of products, um, especially dealing with the supply chain crisis right now. Sean O'Hara, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you here on First Look ETF. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it very much. Inflation continues to be a runaway train, recently hitting 40-year highs. Well, has the train slowed down or is it still uncatchable? That is the burning question on everyone's mind. Well, joining us now to discuss a new ETF designed to hedge against higher inflation is Doug Fincher, Portfolio Manager at Ionic Capital Management. Hi, Doug. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Stephanie. Great to see you. All right, so inflation is at levels that we haven't seen in about four decades. Everyone is concerned about the high cost of food and basic necessities, pretty much the high cost of everything, really. Do you believe that the current bout of inflation will stick around, or do you think that it's waning? We think inflation will be with us for a while. We're not making any kind of extreme call on hyperinflation or anything like that. And we do think that there's a good chance that inflation levels will subside eventually. The question is how fast and to what level. You know, we've been in this deflationary world for so long. I think investors and consumers talk about it, but I don't know that they really appreciate the impact inflation can have not only on purchasing power, but on investment returns. You know, historically, it's taken a long time for inflation pressure to build. You know, you look at a country like Japan, and it takes a long time for it to slow down as well. You know, and from, a, from the Fed's perspective, the, the Fed's committed to raising rates to fight inflation, but monetary policy is a really blunt instrument, and the market perhaps even as the Fed themselves are fixated on month-to-month -month changes like we all are, it, it takes a long time. You know, in the short-term, increases in rates won't have an immediate effect on, on real inflation. Also, I, I think the thing that's got to be on people's minds is what happens if the Fed gets it wrong, you know, like they did by not reducing stimulus last year. I, I don't think that anybody believes that the Fed can get to their 2% target it, 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 within the next year. Um, and again, that point of stagflation, PNG mentioned it on a call, on a call yesterday, and even on a you know if, if the recession is shallow, and I think a lot of, a lot of investors are pinning their their hopes on it, you know, and that's been sort of behind some of the recent um, moves in the market. Um, if in, if the if the inflation 
excuse me, if the recession is shallow, you know, look at the energy complex. You've got a supply a supply problem there, not a demand problem. So a shallow recession is not going to not going to dent uh, dent demand. And then a couple other points. You know, you had a PPI a, a productivity number out today. They talked about rising labor costs. And then two things on the on the on the um, on the on the government front. You know, we had the Chip Act. The Chip Act is essentially deglobalization, and and that's not deflationary. That's inflationary. You know, we're we're not manufacturing chips in California because it's cheaper to do so. We're doing it for national security reasons. And I think finally, the, la the last point, not to be cynical, but you know, you look at this, uh, this Inflation Relief Act that, that, uh, that was signed on Sunday night. Uh, look at the commodities associated with things like EV, copper and silver. Prices spiked on Monday um, because of these su the same supply demand imbalances that, you know, that, that, that we that we've seen in other areas like the commodity complex. So, no, we don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. So bearing all of that in mind, the Ionic Inflation Protection ETF, which is ticker symbol CPII, takes a bit of a unique actively managed approach to hedging against this, I guess, runaway inflation. Tell us more about the fund's strategy and some of its holdings. Sure, thank you. Sure, Stephanie. It's a CPII is designed to profit during periods of sustained elevated inflation increased realized inflation and inflation expectations. To achieve the objective of the fund, we enter inflation swaps, pair swaps on US interest rates, and the balance of the assets are invested in tips. So specifically on the tip front, approximately 90% of the ETF's assets are, in, are invested in short dated tips, which are effectively floating rate notes on inflation. And in our view, the best way to capture elevated CPI. You know, real rates are close to zero, so whatever CPI is, that's your, that's your floating rate yield. Uh, but the fund's combined portfolio goes beyond just owning tips by providing p the potential to generate a return in excess of inflation with this direct exposure to inflation as well as protection around rising rates. And, and the way we do that is two other pieces um, to achieve that objective. The, we take the yield from the tips and, and we purchase two derivatives. The first is five-year zero coupon inflation swaps, which we pay 3% and collect current CPI, which is, you know, give or take 9%. Even if inflation expectations decline, we earn that spread and it accretes monthly. So that's a neat position. And we believe that inflation swaps are the single best way to play higher inflation. As a firm, we're a $4 billion firm. We've been, we've been exposed to inflation swaps this year at the firm level. And we wanted to launch this ETF to isolate that exposure. And then that last piece I mentioned on rates, we own payer swap options which are there to provide exposure to higher rates and cover the scenario where the Fed is not effective and has to keep raising interest rates in an attempt to combat sustain, sustained inflation, almost that, that, um, that stagflationary scenario. And then lastly, the fund does pay a monthly dividend tied to the, to, to the income generated from these, uh, from these instruments. And so how do you see then this ETF being used inside of a diversified portfolio? So I think CPI, it's, it's designed to fill a hole in investors' existing portfolios. How do you get direct exposure to inflation and inflation expectations? And we looked at a lot of the products in the market, and, and, and frankly, you see inflation in, a name, in the name of many of them, but most either own equities that may be, benefit indirectly from inflation or are designed to perform well in an interest rate shock scenario, but nothing that really invests directly in, in tackling that, that inflation theme. We think CPII is a really good diversifier for equity and fixed income, but to your question, um, I think it, it it should be a core holding in an investor's fixed income allocation. We think as much as 10 to 20 percent of that fixed income allocation, because it's got to be, from an efficient frontier perspective, it's got to be big enough to to make a difference. Um, and we think it's important to have that component, you know, something that actually is going to perform well if inflation is rising, and and you know you're losing money in 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 the other holdings that you own. And, and I think just to take a step back for a second, I, I mentioned this earlier, but the, about a year ago, well, at the end of, the end of 2021, the Fed pivot really changed the investment landscape. And we went from this deflationary world that we've all known for the last 30 years to this inflationary one. It was great for stocks and bonds. It, it, it certainly this year hasn't been so good for stocks and bonds. And you look at risk parity and 60-40 strategies, you know, they've had some of the worst returns in, in, in 30 years. So I think it's important to... To, to provide something that you know is going to be a is be, is going to be a, a, a counter to uh, to those sort of trends. So again, the the, the strategy is designed to 
benefit inflation if inflation remains high, if inflation expectations rise, or if the Fed hikes but inflation remains hot and we get and we get that stagflation. So I think finally, if even if you think the Fed will ultimately be successful, it's going to take time, as I mentioned initially. Initially, CPI is a good option, and and it's not a short-term play. We think this is a strategy that's going to be effective for for a number of years. All right. Well, it makes a lot of sense, Doug. Thank you so much. We'll leave it there. Helping investors navigate inflation. Thanks, Stephanie. Despite the current bear market in cryptocurrencies, the adoption of blockchain technology continues to blaze ahead. Now, according to one study, the business value generated by blockchain technology will surpass a whopping $3 trillion in just eight years. And joining us now to discuss the rapidly expanding investment opportunity linked to the blockchain marketplace is Brandon Colavita, Portfolio Manager with Horizon Kinetics. Hi, Brandon. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. So Gartner Research forecasts that the business value generated by blockchain will reach $176 billion by 2025 and $3.1 trillion by the year 2030. Why is blockchain technology such a big deal? So it's a big deal because this technology will disrupt and transform business, business operations across a wide variety of industries. It has the potential to displace existing businesses and provide new opportunities for others. For companies that are successful in integrating this technology, the opportunities are nearly endless. So let's get to how it works. A blockchain is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer ledger of immutable transactions consolidated into digital blocks of data. The blocks are linked together into a chronological chain, meaning that each new block references the transactions in the previous block of data. This goes all the way back to the, to the inception of the chain, so that the entire history is verifiable at all times. The chain is recorded and maintained by all participants, so users can check their records against any proposed transactions in the system. So the question is, why does this add value? Well, less capital needs to be locked up for waiting for clearance, less time needs to be spent on reconciliation, less effort needs to be spent on verifying security and making sure things get from A to B. The tech helps remove many additional steps and intermediaries that are usually necessary to settle a transaction. And that means that systems can transact with greater efficiency, transparency, and security when compared to a traditional centralized network. Virtually any asset can be digitized and stored within a blockchain. And the result is that there is an opportunity to transform the assets that we know into a more robust form and to create brand new products that we haven't seen before. So then the Horizon Kinetics Blockchain Development ETF, which your ticker symbol is BCDF, targets the fast-moving blockchain market. How is the fund different compared to other blockchain funds and what are some of your fund's holdings? Sure. We'd like to start with a little history of our fund. Horizon Kinetics is a, is a long-term value investor, and some think that that's at odds with launching a fund focus, focusing on an emerging technology. But we don't really see it that way. We've always been interested in transformative technology. The, internet, the Kinetics Internet Fund was the world's first internet fund that was launched in 1996. And at that point, our, our approach was as contrarian as it is today. We didn't invest in the high-flying internet startups that populated most internet funds over that period. Instead, we focused on companies that would benefit from the long-term entrenchment of the internet in our, daily, in our daily lives. And when the internet bubble burst, our internet funds holdings still had solid operating businesses. And we take a similar approach when we look at BCDF. We think the blockchain is the most disruptive technology to be introduced since the onset of the internet. So we differentiate ourselves by focusing on high quality, profitable businesses with the greatest potential for success over the long term. So in, with this technology, adoption's still at very early stages within these companies. And there are too many ways to list how blockchain will impact all of these different industries that it affects. So the fund doesn't just hold crypto companies or what you typically deem as a crypto company. It holds businesses that are likely to benefit over the long term from, adoptment, from adoption and entrenchment of blockchain technology. Brandon Colavita, thank you so much. Breaking down your blockchain ETF. It's good to have you with us. Thank you very much. Really appreciate this. 
And that does it for this edition of First Look ETF. Now, if you like the show, tell us in the comments section below and by hitting the like button. A big thanks to all of our guests today, along with Douglas Jonas at the New York Stock Exchange. Be sure to check out homeofetfs.com to learn more. Also, don't forget to pick up the podcast version of First Look ETF. It is available on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, and other major podcasting platforms. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. Thank you so much for watching First Look ETF. We'll see you next time.